name is Gangesh Ganesan. I'm uh, from Pia Nova. Um, just uh, wanted to give you a quick introduction about what the company is and, uh, and what we actually do. Um, you know, we, uh, you know, my co-founder and I, about three years ago, uh, got interested in a topic uh, called Bitcoins. At the time that we got interested in, uh, the price of Bitcoin was something like $10. We thought, uh, oh, this is an interesting technology. We read some of the papers. Uh, this was before Bitcoin actually had hit uh, public consciousness, so no one actually really had heard about it. Uh, it wasn't out in CNN and Wall Street Journal or uh, anywhere else uh, uh, at that point. Uh, we decided that you know maybe maybe we'll learn something by starting a company. Uh, we actually mined bitcoins using uh, some graphics cards that we bought. And uh, the network was actually going through a very, very interesting and massive scale growth at that time. Uh, very soon, Bitcoin actually hit $1,000 in price. Uh, and in about uh, seven or eight months, we had actually had about 6,000 dedicated machines that were mining Bitcoins. Uh, we actually had about 7% of the total Bitcoin network. Our uh, machines were growing at such a rate that we had actually seven megawatts of power that we were consuming. Uh, we had data centers in Iceland, we had data centers in Washington State, uh, we had a data center in Texas, and uh, we mined about uh, $19 million worth of Bitcoin, so it, it kind of happened very, very quickly. Um, but, you know, while that was very interesting, you know, Bitcoin obviously went through, uh, went through a phase where it corrected itself, came down from $1,000, uh, uh, you know, down. We, um, you know, sort of plowed the money back into the company that we were building, and our vision was at that time to try and build some applications on top of this network. Uh, this led us to basically go and talk to a whole bunch of financial institutions who were really interested in the idea of cryptocurrencies, and uh, we started sort of trying to find out uh, what, what, what the magic is about. Uh, in the process of having run this Bitcoin network, we understood all about how the transactions were formed, how the network is actually built, uh, and what the underlying data structure there is. And the data structure there is a unique thing called a blockchain. Uh, and the blockchain is basically a, a public ledger uh, which is auditable and verifiable by anyone who's participating in the network, uh, but keeps, uh, uh, keeps store of all the transactions in the network. And everybody in the industry was fascinated by the ideas behind blockchain and trying to figure out how exactly one could apply the blockchain for enterprise applications, specifically in the financial market. And uh, so, you know, this, this cost us to uh, go and talk to a whole bunch of people in New York, London, um, some of the top financial institutions in the world, some of the top regulators in the world. Uh, and in the process, we sort of understood a few things. Um, what Pianova does today, we, we, we don't really mine Bitcoins actively anymore. Uh, we've actually sort of morphed and transformed our company. Uh, because of the learning we've had, we've actually sort of built a platform which is basically a blockchain platform, but it's inspired by ideas from blockchain rather than just being a blockchain. Uh, and we've actually built an enterprise-grade blockchain platform, combined it with a big data platform, and we build a distributed ledger technology and, and the specific applications and problems we are trying to solve for the banks and financial institutions, I'm going to talk to you right now. As we went and talked to financial institutions, one of the first things that everybody talked to us about was that since 2008, the financial landscape has dramatically changed. Since 2008, lots and lots of new regulations have been added on top of existing regulations that banks have which means banks are actually spending literally billions of dollars on their, on their, on their uh, regulatory compliance side. In fact, if you look at, you know, I've got a very quick summary of some of the new rules that banks have to meet, and these rules are actually increasing in complexity. Uh, several of these rules have been phased in more gradually since 2008. Some of the rules are actually being enforced, uh, are starting to be enforced only right now. Since 2008, uh, the Dodd-Frank reform, which was sort of the big umbrella, uh, you know, uh, set of laws that were put in place to regulate the financial industry. The second major uh, regulation that was put on them was that the Federal Reserve basically administers a set of, set of tests on these banks. Uh, to basically try and figure out whether these institutions are too big to fail. If the institutions don't meet certain guidelines, they are fined heavily. In fact, the amount of fines that some of the banks have paid over the last seven or eight years is staggering. It's over $150 billion of fines have been collected from the large financial institutions uh, in North America alone. 
There's an international regulatory framework now. It's called the Basel III framework. This is a framework for all banks in the world to avoid global catastrophe like what happened in 2008. Additionally, a new rule that has come in, it's the rule that actually got enforced only in 2015 and gets operational only in 2016 and beyond, is called the Volcker Rule. It's actually named after the former Federal Reserve Chairman, uh, Fred Volcker, and it basically is yet another set of regulatory, um, uh, regulatory guidelines that ba banks have to meet. Now, what does this all mean? What this all basically means is that the, the actual cost of running the financial uh, you know, industry is actually tremendously high now. You can look at some of the statistics here. HSBC, their compliance team is 7,000 people. Citigroup actually has 26,000 people working in the company just for doing regulatory compliance. So your question is, what are these 26,000 people actually doing? Well, they're actually doing something in software. They're actually, the part of the financial framework that was all put in, the regulatory framework that was put in basically says, including high-speed trades that are going on in the industry, every single trade, every single event that goes on in a financial institution can be audited in a random manner, which means a financial agency, someone like SEC, FINRA, OCC, Federal, Federal Reserve, any of these different regulatory bodies can come in and ask a bank to say, show me the history of transactions that you did in 2015 on August 15th. In fact, show me how you act actually calculated the price of a particular asset. Show me all the details, all the data that went into actually calculating that particular asset. Now, if you kind of think about it, given that the financial system on a given day handles something worldwide in the range of 150 trillion transactions, 150 billion transactions, to handle 150 billion transactions in a given day across all the systems, you know, the number of messages is somewhere a thousandfold higher. Okay? So the sheer amount of data you're talking about is, is, is mind-boggling. So to actually handle this type of regulatory framework, banks have had to actually hire tens and thousands of people and spend billions of dollars additionally in regulatory costs. So when JP Morgan CEO get up, gets up and says, hey, our regulatory costs are high, that's what they really mean. So the idea then is... And in all of this industry, I don't know if you guys have been following what's actually going on in the space that we call the blockchain space. All of the major banks are extremely interested in this idea of a distributed ledger. Why? Well, in the Bitcoin space, there is this distributed ledger that can be held by anyone, and it's visible to everyone, and it's fully auditable. And when you say auditable, it's actually auditable using mathematical proofs as opposed to auditable in some other mechanism. So the idea then is that banks and financial uh, institutions are looking to build distributed systems in a new way which allows all their transactions to be auditable. In fact, in the last 30 or 40 years as the financial systems have been actually built, they've been actually built with transaction accuracy in mind, not auditability. Now you want transaction accuracy, meaning asset compliance, uh, whatever else that is needed to make a transaction system. You also want it to be fully auditable. In fact, you want it to be auditable and reconcilable in real time using these types of tools. And so there's a lot of interest in figuring out um, how, to, how to do this. So PeerNova has actually built a platform which is based on blockchains. Uh, we've been working with some of the largest financial institutions who become strategic partners with us, telling us what their specific problems are. And we've actually built a, a platform for this. Uh, I'm going to talk very quickly about a couple of applications that, we, that we've been working with. Um, if you look at a banking financial system, uh, it's actually extremely complex. Lots and lots of systems, lots of different transaction databases, lots of different OLAP models for analytic database, uh, analytic uh, solutions, uh, big data clusters, uh, time series view into data because banks actually have different views into the same data. Uh, the reason why there's so many different views of the same data in a bank is because there's lots and lots of different people in a bank. Quants may be active, uh, acting on some data, uh, traders using some other data, compliance and regulatory people looking at different types of data. So there's lots and lots of different systems out there. The goal is, can you actually build a unified system which actually gives you an event lineage view across all these different systems? And the event lineage view is mathematically auditable and, and, and verifiable. Our large customer here is a very large multinational bank uh, with whom we are actually working on this platform. The second platform that we are working on with is yet another large bank. One of the largest banks in the world is a, a bank that we call a custodial bank. They actually act as a bank for other banks. 
uh, we are building a system for them which allows them to do uh, multilateral settling without a clearinghouse. Uh, the way most of Wall Street works, uh, you don't trust your counterparty, so you actually work with what's called a clearinghouse, which is an intermediate organization that facilitates transactions between banks. Uh, the idea here is to, is to gradually go to a model where the different ledgers are actually um, allowing you to be uh, visible on it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.